Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know that we're coming into the room now and getting ready to talk to our expert executive coach and trainer, Joe Ilfield. Um, welcome. I know you're coming in. My name is Anissa Avon, and I am the CEO of Turnkey Coaching Solutions. And our webinar today is Seeing Around the Corner, What Leaders Need to Do Now to Guarantee Their Team's Success for the Future. So we always like to get started uh, right on time. And I want to say thank you for joining us for our Leading in a Crisis Summit, um, Business and HR Strategies. Uh, for navigating change and chaos. And, and our intent today is to give you actionable tips and strategies that you can take back to your team. Uh, so Joe, if you'll uh, hit the deck, we'll go on to our sponsors. I'd like to introduce our sponsors today of our virtual summit is Whitmarsh Consulting Group. Um, David Whitmarsh and his team are professionals in multi-channel marketing and HR information technology consulting. So do reach out if uh, David or his team can be supportive in your marketing efforts. Our other sponsor today is Insperity. And Insperity um, has been kind enough to offer all of our participants um, something I consider pretty valuable, a free HR financial analysis report and debrief at no obligation. Um, we know that a lot of HR departments are being flipped upside down and inside out. And um, my heart breaks every day to hear about the furloughs and layoffs. And um, uh, you, you and your department, if you're one of our HR peers, are needing more support than any other time I can think of in business history. And um, we're here for you. And I was very pleased that Insperity was willing to offer this. Um, it's going to take the business performance advisor anywhere, depending on your organization, from three to, you know, six to eight, ten hours to put this together. So um, don't hesitate to take advantage of it. They really do understand that it, their services are not a fit for everyone. But that is uh, one of the things that they're offering. So um, now I want to share with you every single day we are adding new experts. We've got 40 speakers and counting. When um, my team and I uh, realized that we were all going to be sequestered even from each other, and we um, were also going to be the victims of this pandemic in more ways than one, um, we put our heads together and we said, okay, we, there are things we can't control. There are things that we can. What can we do to help? What are our peers? What are our clients need? And that's where our leading in a crisis, actionable business and HR strategies for navigating crisis and change virtual summit came about. Um, visit that, that link that you see at the top, turnkeycoachingsolutions.net forward slash leading in a crisis, um, or watch for your emails. If you uh, have signed up for just one, we're probably likely to tell you about the other ones that are coming on board. Do also let us know, what are we missing? What topics are of interest that we haven't captured? I will scour our team of experts and then some to make sure that we are supporting you the way that you want to be supported. So just shoot me an email and let me know what we've missed and how we can support you. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention is that we have created multiple special offers. All of our speakers have something to give away or a special offer. Um, all of our sponsors have something special to contribute. And one of the things that Turnkey is doing is buy one, get one virtual training specific for uh, the topics that we need today, crisis management, leadership, and competence related to working from home, um, emotional intelligence, crisis management, um, crisis communication plans, business continuity, a change in your strategic priorities, layoffs and downsizing, you name it. So again, just reach out to me if, if that can be supportive. So I'm super excited to introduce you to our speaker. Um, well, that's one of them. That's me though. Yeah, let's get on to the important one. So Joe Elfeld um, is someone that has really just uh, aligned with Turnkey in so many ways, her values, her competency, um, how she wants to show up. She is a consummate professional in the area of executive leadership, consulting, coaching. She works with a lot of C-suite 
um, leaders and a variety of, of industries and organizations. Joe, what's really interesting is you come from a very different background than a lot of us and, and how you came about your expertise. Tell us what makes you the expert on seeing around the corner and what our leaders need to know right now. Gosh, that's a great question to start out. Um, and I think one of the things that makes me the expert in it is just having helped so many leaders, you know, over 10 years of helping them see around the corner and, you know, going through it with them and seeing what they saw coming, what they didn't see coming, and how you prepare yourself as a leader to be the kind of leader who can be adaptable and can work when there's a lot of complexity and a lot of things going on and it's hard to predict what's happening next. Um, I also have the benefit of teaching in an executive MBA program. So every year I, you know, I go the whole way through with a class of students and, and I watch them grow and change over their 17 month programs. And I see what are the skills that they can really build and develop that make them successful, not just during the executive MBA program, but in the years to follow, because they keep in touch with me and tell me, you know, what has really helped. Very good, very good. Thanks. Should I? Okay. Um, so for those of you who are listening live today, and maybe um, Anissa, you can do it with me, you and I can do it to start out, but I'd love for you to just take a moment and put in the chat box, you know, what's a rose? What's something that's going well for you right now? Or something you can appreciate even in the midst of all this craziness? And then what's a thorn? You know, what one thing is a stressor for you right now? So, you know, while people are taking a little time to put it in the chat box, I'll ask you, Anissa, what would be your rose and thorn right now? Well, to, to be perfectly honest, the one that came up is both my rose and my thorn. I have a teenage daughter. She's 18, freshman in college, and, and I have a 22-year-old who just graduated from Texas A&M in December. And my rose is that both of them, are at home and, um, and taking this seriously. My thorn is that my daughter's only mostly taking it seriously. I can't keep her at home and I'm, I'm having a hard time sitting on her. She wiggles. So. I know that's really hard. And I could tell some people are already, uh, some people are agreeing with you in the chat box that the rose and thorn for them <laughs> is the family <laughs> time. Yeah, I think you wrote rose family time, thorns family time. Sheila wrote rose, my husband and I are being supported to each other and communicating well. Thorn, the unknown is difficult, which leads to anxiety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I will say my rose is that my son actually, I have an 18 year old now too. He turned 18 yesterday. And it was just a really special time to celebrate. I mean, it was just our close immediate family, but we zoomed in the rest of the family. And I was so grateful that there is that technology and that even our parents could figure it out and, you know, get online to wish him happy 18th birthday. And I would say one of the big thorns for me right now is actually how much I'm sitting because I'm doing so much of my work and, you know, with clients on Zoom and in front of the computer, whereas I used to be out and about meeting with clients face to face and, you know, you know, there's getting in and out of your car and everything. And so I'm realizing I have to do a lot more to take care of my back which probably I'm guessing a lot of people listening to this are also sort of dealing with like, do I have a good chair at home to work in? And you know, how is my back dealing with hours and hours of Zoom meetings? One of my clients was telling me yesterday that one of her direct reports told her that they were at a 5 p.m. meeting and she said, this is my 13th meeting today, I'm done. And my client was like, it's fine, let's get off. But like, I think, you know, that is the reality for people and something, you know, if we're seeing around the corner, something we're all going to be dealing with. I see some work coming in. I don't know if you oh had time gosh, to read yes, them while so I was chatting. Many. Um, I want to read one in particular because I really think that it exemplifies what so many of our peers are have experiencing. Um, Angela wrote, Thorn, I'm the only adult working at home with three kids, 11, 8, and 4, and a founder of a new company. 18 months. I just want to cry even hearing about it. As my partner has to be in lockdown in his office, he owns an accounting firm for restaurants, meaning we just both don't have the luxury of two hands on deck. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's something I'm hearing a lot right now from my clients too, especially if one person is a med in a medical profession or, you know, if both people are, you know, doing work where they have to be on meetings and there's younger kids at home. 
that can be a real, real stress on a family. Yeah. So let's talk about how to deal with some of this then. Thank Please. you everyone for posting and, um, and keep the chat coming. Um, so, you know, um, Anise actually did a lovely introduction of me, so I won't say much more about myself except to say that I'm an executive leadership coaching consultant. I'm based in the Bay Area right now. I mean, always, I guess. And, um, but now I'm only doing work in the Bay Area. And, um, and so I work with C-suite leaders and with their teams. And, and I am always helping these, my organizations that I work with think about how do we prepare ourselves, not just for what's going on now, but where we're gonna be you know, in six months, in 12 months, and where we want us to be. Um, another thing that um, I was joking with some people makes me uniquely qualified to talk about complexity is that I have three kids um, and they're actually all three at home now. My 18 year old is my oldest. So um, I joke that, in, you know, with the sibling relationships, if you have um, two kids, you know, you have one sibling potential source of fighting at any given time. And with three kids, you actually have six because you can gang up, <laughs> two, two can gang up on one. So, you know, there's that extra complexity and, you know, making sure that they're all doing well. So I, I bring that as part of my expertise in dealing with complexity. I think that's fair and, and hard won expertise. Thank you. Um, so for today, what we're going to be talking about is, first of all, how do you think about um, the problems and the, the challenges that are going on today, you know, in your organization, in your industry? And how do you use th that to make better decisions, you know, both now and moving forward? And then I also want to talk about, like, how do you set up an effective communication strategy with your teams, especially when a lot of people have gone you know, virtual almost overnight. And how do you use that to make your team stronger for not just now, but for the future too? And then lastly, you know, hoping we have time, but of course, happy to answer any questions if they come in too. But how do you create some new ground rules and agreements, both with your work team and with your home team? You know, for me, I've had to text everyone in my family, I am doing this online thing, please don't come into my office, even for the printer, which is behind me, you know, for the next hour. So, you know, for a lot of us, we have to have new agreements, you know, with our kids, with our families about, you know, how we work together and share this work home space. Yeah. Um, so I'll jump right in, if that's okay. Nisa? Please do. Okay, great. So um, I don't know how many people on this call have heard about the term VUCA, but this is a term that is being used a lot when people think about the world this day, today, which is that there's a lot more volat volatility. I don't think I have to convince anyone of that right now. There's a lot more uncertainty. I saw in one of the thorns that someone had said, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's happening next, and that worries me. Um, and there's a lot of complexity. If we think about, you know, IBM in the 1950s or something, you know, you went to work, you know, the, the computer landscape was pretty certain, you know, it wasn't changing maybe every like five to 10 years, not, you know, every six to 12 months like it is now. And so, and then there's global forces that are at work in ways that they weren't before. So there's a lot more complexity that leaders are thinking about and dealing with now, um, diversity than we ever did before. And then there's a lot of ambiguity, like how, what is going to be the effect of what we do and what does it actually mean like when we talk about a diversity in the workplace when we talk about you know suddenly making a, a workforce remote and working from home what does that mean that's really ambiguous for people even to think like do i just do my normal work day at home is there more flexibility now like so there's a lot of ambiguity baked into everything we're doing so some of the strategies that i'm talking about aren't helpful just now but they're also helpful you know, in thinking about a VUCA world that we live in. So I'm gonna introduce a decision, uh, decision sort of way of thinking about problems that comes from Dave Snowden. And he actually developed it working for IBM, I think in 1999, but it's even more relevant today. So when we think about different decisions, there are simple decisions. And simple decisions are the kind of things like, if you do A, you get B. So, you know, let's just say most of the time if we, you know, if we press the button on our computer, it turns on. Or, you know, if our kids learn two plus two equals four, you know, that always stays the same. 
So those are really simple decision rules. So, you know, we probe, we figure out what the rule is, and then we respond and, you know, we have a rule in place. Like, so if this happens, we do this. And those are really easy things to deal with. Sadly, we don't get many of those in business anymore. And then we have the complicated. And the complicated are, you could think of it almost like flying a plane. Like there are a lot of rules and a lot of things you can think about, but once you know how to do them, then, you know, usually it works all the time. You know, we won't talk about special situations, but, you know, or building a car. Like it's a very complicated process. There's a lot that goes into it, but once you figure it out, you get it done. You know, you could say taxes are this way, you know, it takes accountants a ton of time to understand the taxes, you know, thank you to our listener at home whose husband is doing that for all of us. Right. Um, but once you understand the tax code, you know, as complicated as it is, you know, you can respond, you can analyze what the code is, what's happening and respond, and then you have a set of good practices. And then we have the situation that I would say even before COVID-19, most of us found, find ourselves in which is complex and complexity. And complex situations are the thing where sometimes you do A and Y happens, and sometimes you do A and Z happens. And so the patterns aren't immediately evident to people. And it's not, it's not this kind of like you can plug in, you know, even if it takes a long time to find all the numbers, you can plug in and go. And so what happens in complexity is that to work with it really well, we actually have to do more experiments. So we have to start a, sort of start with more local experiments. Well, like what happens if we do this? Like what are the results? So for companies, you might think about like if you're releasing a new product, instead of doing this like massive release, you know, around the world, like how do we release it to a small group, get some feedback and move on? How do we then, you know, enlarge that? What, what is the feedback we're doing? And one of the big, um, learnings about complexity and that I'm often talking to my clients about is that people often in, 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 and this is all of us because we like things that make sense and we like knowing what's right and what's wrong. So we're often looking at complex situations and trying to make them complicated, which means we're spending a lot of time analyzing and trying to figure out the rules and trying to figure things out. So if we just knew this thing, then we could do this. And to be honest, I find myself doing this even now with COVID-19. Like I wake up and I ask my husband, who's, you know, a doctor, so he's always looking at the numbers, like how much have the numbers gone up? Where have they gone up? Are they starting to, you know, are they starting to go down yet, right? I'm trying to take this very complex situation and see if I can figure it out. If I know when the numbers are going down, you know, when will we, <laughs> you know, when will I be free to leave my house? But um you know, and the, but this is what people are doing in the business world too, is that they're taking things that are complex and they're, tr they're putting their heads down and just desperately trying to figure them out as opposed to acting with a little bit more um, experimentation and trying to do some new things. So you're probably going to get to this a little later, but um, first of all, I, I love the decision-making model that you're sharing. And, and also, I'd like for you to, at some point to speak about, it's one thing to use a decision-making model when our life is normal. It's another thing yeah. when we're under such extreme stress. And I find that our, that many of us are, uh, and leaders that we're working with, our default setting is not to reach for a formula or a methodology or even something that we know works, but um, that reactive place. So can you speak to that a little? Yeah, that's great. I'm just going to finish up the model yes, just please. so that, you know, and then wrap up and then, you know, move on. Thank that's you. a Thank great you, next question. Thank you. Um, but the last stage is sort of chaos. And, you know, and this could be where a lot of us find ourselves now, which is, you know, hey, you go to the store and there's not even toilet paper or there, you know, or you don't, you can't even get into the store now, right? The lines are so long, um, around, wrapping around the corner the other day in my neighborhood. So, mm -hmm. um, and when you're in situations of chaos, then really the best practice is to act because you want to do something and then see what, you know, see if you can find some stability and then go from there. But when you're in a chaos, chaotic situation, you're wanting to act and do something. And I think, you know, this is what, you know, turnkey coaching has done so well. It's like, you know, this chaotic situation, who knows what's happening in leadership. And you guys are like, okay, we're going to act and we're going to put together this summit so that we can help people. 
and help people find, try to find some stabilization, you know, within it. Um, but so your question, let me, now that I've forgotten part of it, I apologize. Well, and I think you started I just, to answer it. You know, it's, it, it is, we, we do have moments of going into chaos through the decision-making process. So my question in, in its essence is about if someone hasn't built a skill set around decision making already. We know that during times of crisis, we're right, really in trouble when it comes to quality decision making. Yeah. So how does an organization help their people implement a decision making process, for example, or even teach one or two leaders how to make better quality decisions using a model if it hasn't already been implemented or if that hasn't already been introduced? Yeah. Okay, great. And, um, and so I'll, you know, I, I'll give sort of one of my big tips that, you know, I've been reading about and hearing about and I think is so helpful right now. But if you look at what first responders are doing, you know, when they're like 9-11 you know, and, you know, how first responders respond to things that are really chaotic and have, you know, and, you know, what they do is, you know, people, they first, they get people together regularly in the morning, like, you know, first responders, everyone, you know, are at the beginning of a shift and they talk about what they know, what they don't know, you know, what the, you know, and what they've been doing so far. And then the second thing is that they're constantly sort of doing what many in the business world would call postmortem. Like, okay, this is what happened yesterday. What could we have done better? Or what went, you know, what went well during the shift? What didn't go well? And I think for a lot of our organizations who are in chaos right now, you know, there's two great lessons for that. One is, how do you start getting people together, even if it's for a quick moment? You know, a lot of my clients have moved to just daily huddles with their team for 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be in 8 a.m., you know, if you don't want to make your people with young kids suffer, you know, you could have your daily huddle at noon or something, you know, you can be flexible. But I think it is really important to have these things where you start to put the information together that everyone's having, like, you know, what have we learned since yesterday? You know, what do we know more since yesterday, you know, in our industry, in the world, um, you know, maybe with different factors with, you know, our employees, what they, what's happening with them. And so it's a great way to communicate out information, but also get information back from your people. And I think that's important in decision making right now because people are more separated. So you want to make sure that you have ways of collecting back what your people are seeing and learning. But then you also want to, you know, and we can think of reactive in, you know, the good way and the bad way. Like sometimes we're reactive, like something happens and we just react and without thinking, you know, without pausing and being thoughtful about it. But other ways we can be reactive is we can be noticing like, hey, what are, is, are we as a team or as an organization doing that's working right well, doing that's working well right now, let's do more of that. And what are we as an organization doing that's actually hindering us or stressing out our people or, you know, making, you know, making people not work well together, how do we fix that? Yep. And I think that that kind of sort of like, more frequent post-mortem when you're in this chaos and then the complexity is so essential for businesses to be doing right now. But I think it also sets you up for the future for having much better communication and, you know, being able to more quickly respond in the future to what's working and what's not. Agreed. Agreed. Can you speak a little bit to how, well, first, I'm not quite sure I understand the words on your model. Um, the decision making matrix right there. So tell me what I'm looking at when it says under complicated sense, analyze and respond. Right. So yeah, I can definitely go through this. I'd love to get to some other tips, but I'll just explain that one. Like in a complicated system, basically you're sort of sensing what's around in the system. You're analyzing like, okay, so what do we know like about building cars? Like if we do this first and then we do this. So you're analyzing all the processes and then you're responding by putting good practice into place. So this, these are in order. So in all of these, the, yes. in a simple, you're probing, you're sensing, then you're responding. In, in chaos, no, you're sensing, you're categorizing. Do I need to run from this? Do I need to stay put for, for with this? And you're responding. So that's very helpful. And I know you're going to get to some other tips. And at some point, I'd like for you to address 
how to use the model to accelerate decisions, because that's also something that has to happen right now in our, in our companies. The uh, managers need to know how to accelerate the speed with which they are able to analyze and respond appropriately. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of what we know about working in complexity is really relevant here because it's this idea of experimentation. I think that for businesses today, you really need, I mean, especially right all the time, but especially right now, to have the sense of what can I experiment with? What can I try? What can we try doing? And then, you know, it's sort of that old thing of like throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. But I think the more that you can do that in, in, you know, in a thoughtful way, so you throw the spaghetti on the wall and then you actually look at what sticks. Why didn't this stick? Why did this stick? And then you, and then you make more experiments from there. But I think that's the way of making faster decisions is that you don't make, you know, billion dollar decisions. You know, right now you're making like, okay, well, what's a million, you know, depending on the size of your company, you know, what's a hundred thousand dollar decision we can make right now or what's a million dollar decision we can make right now instead of making you know like betting the whole you know horse and pony on it that makes perfect sense awesome thank you um and this sort of starts to also go to what you're talking about with decisions this is actually a, it's part of a video i i screenshotted it from um chicago in the shed aquarium i'm actually from chicago so um, they let the penguins out during, um, you know, during COVID-19 because to see their surroundings and what they and what they're able to see around them. And so I just thought this was, first of all, adorable. But second of all, <laughs> wait, are we going to be able to Google what this video is? Yeah, you can. It's on Instagram. You can, you know, shed aquarium on Instagram. You can see it. It's gotten okay. a lot of likes. <laughs> but I thought this is really what we're doing right now in companies is like, there's a lot going on, you know, and there's a lot going on, you know, in our department, in other people's departments, in other functions, you know, in other companies. And how do we as leaders become the one who's both finding out about that and communicating that back to our people? I think right now that's more essential than ever to sort of, as a leader, take time to understand what is happening around me, you know, what's happening around me in my department, what's happening around me in my company, what's happening around me in my industry, you know, in the world. So you can start to see that. And then you can also start to share that with your people. I think right now, what people are really looking to their leaders to do is to be transparent about what they know and what they don't know. And I, of course you can as a leader, it is possible to over communicate and overwhelm your people with, you know, all hands meetings and everything, you know, right now. But I do think, you know, having that daily check in, one of my clients I was talking to is doing a letter, you know, like an email every day to their whole organization, you know, which is an essential service. So everyone is still working in that organization, but some remotely, some not. Um, but, you know, a letter so that the people who are at home and feel disconnected from what's happening, you know, on site know what's happening. And the people who are on site and feel disconnected from their remote colleagues and, you know, what's happening out there because they're so busy on site. It's this way of getting people together and sharing information, sharing what we do know and what we don't know. And I think that if you look at, you know, with work people who questions people have about whether workers will be furloughed, whether workers, there will be layoffs. I think as a company and as an organization, it's really important to communicate what you do and don't know about that. You're not making promises to people, but you're saying like, at this point, we're not planning on laying off people. Or at this point, you know, I have one organization, they have had to furlough all, you know, a lot of their workers. And they said, you know, we're furloughing you right now. And then this is our plan to bring you back, you know, assuming that, you know, things happen in May. So, I mean, of course, things might not happen in May, and then they know they'll have to go back and revise that. But I think that is one of the big things that gets people loyal to you and has your team build trust, even during this time, is to know that, is to not allow that water cooler conversation to happen, which might be happening via Skype chat and, you know, Slack channels now, rather than, you know, rather than by the office water cooler. But you want to be the leader of the information that's coming out about your company or your department or your, your sector of the world, rather than trying to catch up with the gossip or having people come to you that way. 
So you're really um, identifying something that I think during a crisis is difficult for many people to manage, myself included, and that is seeing around the corner, knowing that how my actions or our actions as leaders are going to impact our team and getting ahead of that. And I think that it's difficult enough in times of normal business um, to, to take for granted that people can just you know, catch the ball that we throw to them. And if they don't, well, bad on them. Uh, oops, I can say I'm sorry later. And um, what you're sharing with us right now is, no, this is not a time. It, yes, it's a time for experimenting. Yes, it's a time for throw, throw out uh, options when it comes to what do we do with this. But you're also saying have foresight when it comes to communicating your plans and engaging your employees in the decisions. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. And um, I think that, you know, similar to what I said before about how you, you know, do that postmortem, you know, how you learn from your employees too. It, it's a, you're, you really want to create two-way communication streets. So you want to be communicating out, you know, what you think is happening, what you think the priorities are, what you think the, you know, what you think your people should be focusing on, but you also want to hear back from them. You know, one of my clients was actually telling me um, yesterday, we were talking, and she told me that one of her employees, they were going to cut this project. I mean, it wouldn't have affected this employee's, um, you know, workload or job or anything, but they were just going to cut some part of a project she was working on. And she actually made the case, no, you shouldn't cut this project and this is why. And, you know, and my client, you know, took it right back up to the CEO and the executive team. And they said, yeah, you're right. That's actually a good idea. So here she was able to learn from her employees and, you know, and get that perspective of like, no, this is why this project shouldn't be cut. And this is why this could be, you know, is a crucial project for us. Because oftentimes, you know, the exec team is making decisions without all the information. We all are right now. But then allowing that information to come back to us and being willing to change and experiment you know, with something new is, I think, so crucial right now. And that's a very fair statement that um, foresight does depend also on that two-way communication. We have a, an associate who is working for a company who um, she, it's a manufacturing company and they get many of their parts from China. And so they knew months ago they knew months ago what was happening there, and they could have made a crisis management plan way back when. And um, she actually brought this to her boss who said, we're not going to do anything in response to this Corona thing. It's not going to hit us like that. I don't, I'm not going to make my marketing plan based on that, which at the time, you know, everyone said, well, okay. And now the company has laid off about 80, 90% of their employees. And I, it, I, they don't know what they're going to do because it was, it, the, for them, That's it's going to last a lot longer. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. Horrid. And I'm sharing that because it, we cannot, what you're sharing about two-way communications cannot go understated. How do our HR professionals and our leaders actually ask for that two-way communication? How do they... How do they be receptive to that? And what's a, a methodology to, to, to make that dialogue real for people? Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Um, you know, and I think there's questions, you know, that you can sort of ask your people, you know, like, what are we doing? What are we doing that's going well, that's working right now, you know, that we should keep doing, you know, the stop, start, continue. You know, what should we start doing that we haven't been doing that would be really effective? And what's something we should stop doing that isn't effective right now? Um, you know, one of my, um, one of my C-level clients has, you know, a very ambitious CEO who has, you know, very ambitious plans for the company. And, you know, they're in healthcare right now, so they are swamped. Um, you know, it's not a question of laying off people. It's more a question of managing the deluge. Um, and, you know, and she says, like, we can't, we, we have to, as a company, figure out which part of the plans that we need to let go of, because this is just not all happening right now. So I think what you start doing is just as important as what you stop doing. Right. And, you know, letting your employees say, like, these are, you know, these are what we're dealing with right now. This, or the other question to ask is, like, where do you need support right now? Like, what are the things that I can help you with? Or what are the things that I can find someone to help you with? 
um, another one of my companies, you know, in healthcare was saying that, you know, the doctors who work for their organization were saying, what do you need me to do? I'll do anything. Just let me know how you need help. And she said, I've never seen them do that before. You know, I've never seen people just so willing to step outside, you know, their comfort zone or their, their lane and just be really helpful. And I think that in some ways is the beautiful thing we're seeing all around the country around the world is people who are stepping outside themselves and really being of use. And I think as leaders, we can't underestimate that there are some people who are just literally sitting at home, they're alone, they have nothing else, and they want to be of service, they want to be of help. And we have other people who have three kids running around under the age of six, and they might need more of that help right now. And that's just where we are, you know? Yeah. Excellent. That's, re that's really helpful. Um, I want to mention that um, tomorrow, about this talk about two-way listening. Um, tomorrow, we actually have an expert on um, a pretty advanced artificial intelligence related to listening to your employees. Wow. Um, it's actually the CEO of Weave.ai, and he's speaking on crisis communication and employee feedback, how to create the rally effect your company needs. And that's tomorrow at 1130. Um, but that is as you were speaking, I'm thinking in the middle of a crisis, how do we also make time for that two-way dialogue when we're also trying to make big decisions on what do we do? How do we do this? Uh, you know, if you're in healthcare, there's not even time to make decisions. It's time to just simply, this isn't about planning. It's about responding. Um, if you're in manufacturing, it's about, okay, what do we do now? So um, can you speak a little bit about that, the, the, the a system, you, this is about systems in this case, we know we need to communicate, we know we need to listen, but what's a good system or, around getting that feedback that doesn't overtax an already taxed HR department or leadership team? That's a great question. And I wish there was like a one size fits all answer to this. Right. Obviously there's not, you know, if you are a company of, you know, like less than a hundred employees, it's going to be very different to get feedback, you know, throughout your company than it is if you're a company, you know, with a hundred thousand employees globally. I mean, that's really going to change. Um, but I think, but part of it, I think is, you know, and this goes back to once again, the, um, you know, how you deal with things in complexity is I think making experiments. So maybe one way you make an experiment is you say, hey, email this if you're seeing, you know, email this, you know, helpline if you're seeing one thing. And then if you get like 10 things that are really great, you're like, oh, that worked. If you get like 50,000 responses and you're like, we can't go through this. Okay, we need to think of something else, you know, like, you know, so I think part of it is an experimentation depending on where your organization is at. And like, can you fit everyone on a Zoom call, you know, where you can see faces? If that, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, you can do a great Q&A and hear a lot about what's bubbling up for your employees. You know, just take an hour of time and do that. If that's not your situation and you're much more a global thing, like I saw, um, I saw on YouTube, I think the CEO of Marriott posted, you know, something really lovely about how they were trying to take care of their employees and, you know, what they were doing to do that and, you know, how they were, you know, as an organization taking leadership to help their employees. So, yeah, you, you might be sort of resorting to video, you know, maybe not YouTube, but some kind of videos <laughs> and getting comments and looking at the comments. I mean, you do have to be flexible in terms of how you do this, um, but I think being willing to try certain things and making it clear to people that you do care about having a two-way conversation, that it isn't just a one-way conversation, I do think goes a long way. And I do think that a lot of what organizations are doing right now, it will change for the future, how people view them in terms of trust, both their employees and their customers, in terms of how people handle things. I just um, posted in the chat box, I'd love to hear from the folks on the call, what are you guys That's doing great. that is effective, that is successful in listening to your employees or not? What are you considering uh, doing? Um, yeah, maybe even post our, have, has, your, has your organization been listening to its employees so far? Like that'd be great, interesting uh, thing that, for I would like to, to get some, definitely some good feedback about that. You know, it's not necessarily a time for a big engagement survey. That's not going to work. No. 
up what you're doing, you know. <laughs> okay, so Scott says they're doing daily huddles, AM and PM. So daily that's Excellent. awesome. Um, asking employee daily check-ins, asking employees how they're doing and connecting with them. So these are great. Like you can see some organizations and teams, you know, they have it. Uh, you know, they, you know, sort of, it might be even a natural for them. For others, it, it might be like a shift of how they view communication you know, in their organization. And, but I think now is in some ways an amazing time to shift because in the middle of this, you have opportunities. You have opportunities to be nimble and try new things. And people forgive you if you get it wrong right now. I think that a lot of big organizations and, and small often feel like they're under the microscope. And if they do one stupid thing, you know, like the whole world, like, oh my God, what were you thinking doing this thing? You know, whatever. But I think right now people are really forgiving. And so I think this is the chance to try some things as an organization and be more responsive and, you know, and see what happens, see if it works or how it works best. Yeah, yeah. very good. Um, you know, sort of on the theme of, you know, being more responsive. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, I, I'm sure many here recognize this guy. He was on a BBC interview um, probably a couple of years ago now. And, you know, while he was doing this, you know, interview from his home office in South Korea, you know, then first his daughter came in and then his son came in on the walker. And it's pretty much the funniest video, one of the funniest videos I, as someone who works at home a lot, has ever seen. But I think this is the other thing to be, that organizations need to be thinking about. And I call this, you know, I really think this is about how you're building your team now to be successful in the future, because you are having some people who are working with these young people from home who might be coming in at any given moment. And you know, and you're working with other people who have kids who are in remote schools that they're on the phone lines that the zoom lines like in my household, we can have five people on zoom at once. Like, you know, luckily so far it has stayed during this. <laughs> my boys are on spring break so they don't have any class right now so we have two down anyway. But, um, you know, I think that this is a really important time for companies also to take a lead in terms of how do we help employees manage work-life balance? And how do we as a company become more flexible with the challenges that people do have in managing it? And um, I think that this is something that is always talked about and very rarely done anything, anything is done about. And I think now more than ever, this is a place where organizations can take the lead um, in their teams, you know, even if it's just a team leader and really understanding like what is happening for my, these different employees? Like what is the difference between Bob and Sue and Diana and Deshaun? You know, like what are their circumstances like? And really understanding, I think so many of us have been sort of inculcated with this idea that's like work is work and home is home and now all those boundaries are dissolving but i think that means that it's really up to you know leaders in the workforce to help their employees set up systems that work for them yep. um so you know i just i'll throw out a few ideas anisa if you have you know things you've heard about or people on the chat too. If there is anything your organization is doing really well or not doing well, like how are you dealing with sort of the dispersity difference in circumstances? You know, similarly, some people have aging parents who, you know, maybe they are delivering food to or trying to take care of. Maybe they're trying to do it all from afar and they can't go in. I have a lot of friends whose parents are in places now where the, they've been locked in, you know, they, so they can't even visit and provide that support. So people at all are worrying about, you know, kids and parents and loved ones at yes. all ranges of the spectrum. Well, and, you know, um, something that um, uh, Jacques, uh, I think it's Jacques, um, uh, sent in our chat room earlier really struck me as accurate. He, um, they wrote, I'm concerned about potential intergenerations tensions and potential social unrest. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't even dawned on me. I don't know why, other than, you know, my imagination running wild in some areas, but the social unrest piece and the intergenerational 
um, conflict. And you see the videos of folks um, going to, to see their elderly parents or grandparents and having to wave and you know kiss, blow kisses through the window. What, um, how does someone, how does an organization use a decision-making model or decision-making methodology to address some of that? We know we're going to have conflict in these areas. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's funny. I, I don't have an end-all be-all answer, but I can tell you some things I've been thinking about, you know, as I've been processing this with friends and with my clients. Like one thing I think is understanding when, like what the time and place for exceptions are. You know, I was talking about this with, um, you know, with one of my clients who is someone is, you know, a little bit more rigid and doesn't like, you know, doesn't believe there should be exceptions and she's in a healthcare setting. So she is, you know, she and her team are all, you know, at work all the time, you know, and we were talking about is how do you make exceptions and how do you sort of um, bend the rules, so to speak, or maybe sort of throw out the rule book right now. And I think that is one thing that is important to this in decision making for companies to think about where can we throw out the rule book right now and where can we not. I mean, obviously, if you think about things like bullying or workplace harassment, like you can't throw the book out on that, you know, like that can't happen now that can't happen ever, you know, so it's I'm not saying you want to throw the whole rule book out. But, you know, some organizations have really rigid time cards, you know, like you check in at a certain time, you check out at a certain time, like this might be a time when you think about that differently. Like this might be a time for especially with parents of young kids where you say, okay, we're fine if you work from 8 to, you know, 8 p.m. to 12 p.m. at night, you know, if that's how you make it work. Or, you know, I've heard a lot of dual uh, career families, you know, the husband will work in or, you know, once one parent will work in the morning, one parent will work in the afternoon, and, you know, and they'll switch off working with the kids, you know, who's with the kids. So, you know, changing, you know, whether people have to be at mandatory meetings, you know, if the mandatory meeting is at 10 a.m., that might be a lot harder, or if the, you know, so just, you know, in recording meetings that you wouldn't usually record, that would be like another way where I think companies want to be really thoughtful about the human impact of their decisions right now, because I think these will reverberate for a while. And I don't think you will get social unrest if people feel they're being seen as a human and as an individual rather than as just a number in the company. And I think that, I mean, I think honestly, that's always important, but I think it's important, even more important right now because there is such differences and even the best laid plans, you know, someone who has the best childcare or whatever could have, you know, you know, I have a friend who has a, you know, a, she has a three-year-old and six-year-old and, you know, a full-time nanny who happens to live in a very, you know, place where there's a lot of people who live together and she's just decided that's not safe anymore. So you could have, you know, you can have all these things set up when they're the quote unquote ideal circumstances, but this isn't right now. So then how do you work with people in that new way? Um, How do you, how do you help them with a friend of mine is working in schools and they, in some schools, they are giving families who don't have internet access, mobile hotspots so that they can work without internet access. I'm guessing most employees have internet access, you know, in the companies, but it's that same idea. Like, how do we think about how we can help our employees work better right now, even if it means giving things that we wouldn't ordinarily ever think to give to them? Brilliant. Brilliant. Would you mind going, go back to that decision maker matrix for a moment? Because a lot of what you're bringing up, and I know that we're about to wrap up, but a lot of what you're bringing up is in the areas when we, um, after we've responded to the crisis or in, in a dire situation at hand, social distancing, get it done, right? Um, lock down, make that happen, et cetera. Then you're looking at in this decision-making model, are, is the goal to learn how to categorize what's in front of you pretty quickly so you can determine, is this a, a, a complex situation where I just you know, need to respond? And, and I think a lot of us do this naturally, but how are people that are taking a decision-making model like this and implementing it with their team, finding it to be helpful? What, what's the impact of that or not? Great question. I think the impact is that 
if you can start to work with your team to divide, like what is, you know, what is simple? Like, okay, it's sort of simple that everyone has to work from home. Like, you know, X, if we can, if we have to close the office, then Y, everyone works from home. Done. Okay. Then, you know, it might be complicated. How do we get everyone computers logged on, you know, like, you know, being able to um, get, you know, remote into their, you know, desktop at work, whatever, you know, these things. So those things can be complicated, but they can be done. Like, you know, we've figured out how to remote into different desktops, how to set up technology systems, how to, you know, get people all onto Zoom or Ring Central or WebEx or whatever it is. So those are sort of the complicated decisions that, you know, happen right now. Or how do we, you know, how do we deal with these, um, you know, new, new regulations that are coming in that we have to deal with now with, you know, COVID-19. Okay, we figure out a system, it might be complicated, but then we figure it out, that's done. So I think the first thing is you're ca- going through and you're categorizing like what you need to do, almost like if you took your to-do list of, you know, ha- things that need to happen right now in your workplace. And you start figuring out like, what are the simple things that we can deal with? What's more complicated that we need to, you know, we need to put someone on to research it and, you know, ex- analyze it and, you know, and then we can respond. Th- those are those categories. And then the complex things. How do we, um, how do we start thinking about experiments? How do we do some brainstorming, think about experiments and try things out? And then the chaos, like, where are the places right now that we just need to act to stabilize? Like yeah. where, you know, where are people's panic buttons going off so, you know, so hard that, you know, maybe the CEO says, look, everyone's getting 80% pay, but we will pay you definitely through June. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and so like there's a, you know, so then the CEO acts or someone acts and then, and then, you know, that stabilizes some of the chaotic parts of the system too. That's very helpful. What do you say to someone who, we all know people who their style of decision-making is in one of these quadrants at all time, no matter what. Their ability to adapt around this quadrant has stilted, has been stifled. They don't believe that there's a reason to adapt their decision-making. How might someone support someone in understanding the need for clarity? Um, like this? It's a great question. I mean, in some ways you're asking like, how do people develop? Like, right. How do we, how do we develop the skills of leadership? You know, obviously I'm a leadership coach, so I'm a little biased in terms of, (laughs) you know, coaching as one way to work with someone like that. But um, I would say that the more that you can first get people out of you know, what I would call like limbic response, emotional response, you know, how do you get people, you know, to take a deep breath, to calm down, to not be in fight or flight, you know, that's the first thing, because I think when we are, when we have those sort of emotional, like, I have to respond, I have to respond, I have to do something about this right now, you know, we might be acting like it's a chaotic situation, and we just need to act, when it's actually a complicated situation, and it needs people to sit and think about it and analyze it. So, you know, so that's one thing is just calming down our nervous system or helping someone take a deep breath, maybe go for a walk around the block, you know, not next to them, but send them out to take a walk around the block. Um, could, you know, that's one way that we can sort of calm the system so that pe- help people make better decisions. I think another way is really asking good questions. I mean, that's what coaching is, but asking questions where there isn't a yes or no answer. So instead of like, do you think we should do this or this? Yeah, you know, or, you know, um, you know, or, you know, um, inst- like, instead ask, like, do you think this is the right thing to do? Instead of doing that, ask, like, well, tell me three reasons how we would know this would be successful. Or can you give me three examples when you would worry this isn't the right decision? If we saw these things happening, you would worry this isn't the right decision anymore. So you want people to think out a little bit farther than most people often do. You know, you want people to think about like, what would be the signs of success, the road, the road marks, markers, so that they would know, okay, we're on the right track. What would be the signs that we're heading into the wrong track? And so then, and that's really a lot of what seeing around the corner is in decision making is like, it's setting up signposts for yourself, and then actually remembering to look for them, yep. and to check back in and make sure you found you if which ones have you seen? Have you seen the signs of success? Or have you seen these warning signs that you said would be like a, you know, an indication maybe to turn around? Mm-hmm. Very good. 
Well, very good. Um, for you guys that are still on with us, type in as we're uh, about to check out, um, what are your takeaways from today? What did you find to be helpful? Um, Scott wrote, um, got to jump off for another call. This has been great. Thank you. Um, I hope that we will have access to the recorded webinar and you certainly will, Scott. So, um, uh, Joe, tell us a little bit about your special uh, that you're uh, doing for the folks that have attended as well as how to get in touch with you. Yes, so I have um, a free leadership assessment, um, you know, in all honesty, developed before COVID-19, will not say anything about COVID-19 in it, but it is something that has great tips for, you know, as a leader, how to communicate, how to think about clear communication with your people, and, you know, also to think about how you're showing up with your people. So that's the first thing. Is the other, is my... Uh, other offer on here? I don't you know. No, we, I, we did not put the other one okay. on because it's a giveaway though. And oh, it's so a giveaway. So you had, I was afraid everyone would want it. So I wanted you to tell us how you're going to manage that. Oh, I thought that you was guys the, were choosing the giveaway. Right. Um, so okay, I think it, was no. a, it was a session with you in addition. So it was a yes. few of them. So, right. Yes. So um, I work with one leadership assessment that I love called the Enneagram assessment. And so what I'm offering is that, you know, I will, you know, give you that assessment, you know, it's a paid assessment, but you know, that you will get that. And then I will also go through it with you and help you understand, you know, how to use this assessment, especially now in the, um, you know, where there is a lot of chaos and, you know, complexity, you know, where these, you know, stress parts of your personality or leadership style might show up and also how to mitigate them so that you're leading in the best way that you can right now. Beautiful. And, and Joe, you can reach Joe at her uh, website, insighttoleadership.com forward slash leadership hyphen assessment forward slash. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. This was really thank you. great. Um, it was so lovely to talk to you. And thank you for everyone who typed something into the chat box. Um, it's really lovely to have that interaction. So it's not like I'm just talking to my computer screen. And exactly. Anisa, of course. Exactly. So I um, want to say that uh, thank you guys for showing up and sharing with us. Do let me know what um, other topics you'd like to see. Come back and join some of our other speakers. We have more on remote work. We have um, this afternoon, we have one more and it's about compassionate outplacement. So and uh, out, uh, I should say, dispersing your employees compassionately. Um, unfortunately, it's a very timely and, and painful topic, but we're going to tackle it with an expert this afternoon. So um, thank you very much, Joe. Excellent, excellent um, expertise. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank and you so much, Anissa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Y'all have a stay safe and healthy.